Chairman, thank you very much. Um, the title of this is very clear. Uh, there are three issues, and I'm going to take them one after the other. That's the worst of a, a Jesuit training. You take the title quite literally. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the certainties. Firstly, we're clear about the negotiating process, also about the timetable under Article 50. We're clear about the opening positions of the two sides. We're clear that the United Kingdom is looking for the impossible. And we're clear about the danger points in these discussions, the Brexit bill and the role of the court. <clears throat> well, but now, about the process, we're clear that it is being conducted uh, under Article 50 of the TEU. This makes the point that the treaties here are absolutely and utterly paramount. <clears throat> the European Union side is not going to depart one iota from what's in the treaties, because it can't. There will be no deviation, and the negotiations will consist really of two separate parts altogether. One about the withdrawal agreement, which is to be conducted within, concluded within two years, and secondly is the new relationship between the Union and the United Kingdom to be concluded inside the space of three years. These negotiations will be conducted in sequence and not in parallel, as Mrs May had originally hoped for and which she had repeatedly demanded, uh, but they've had to concede that that's impossible. The negotiations, the first, the withdrawal agreement is going to be conducted, as we know, under Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union. It consists of three phases, as we heard last night from the Minister, but just to recap, first, citizens' rights, then the Brexit bill, then Ireland. That's to be done by November. Then they will consider the future framework and uh, also transitional arrangements to which I will return. The Article 50 timetable to start with that is very interesting. The first phase has got to be completed by November if the timetable is to be met. And then we will move on to phase two, only if sufficient progress has been made on phase one. And what's meant by sufficient progress is not quite clear, but we know who will make the decision as to whether or not it has been made, and that is the European Council, in other words, the heads of state and government, in other words, a political decision. Allowing, <coughs> if that is done, then there will be completion within a year of the, uh, of the rest of the, of the withdrawal agreement. So in other words, November of next year, and that's to allow about four months for the, well, for the agreement to be drafted in legal form, which is going to be extraordinarily complicated, and then to be ratified both by the European Council, in other words, all the governments, uh, and most cru crucially and critically by the European Parliament, which must not be overlooked, which has in fact got a veto over the whole process. In respect of the new relationship timetable, uh, it will start and only start after the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union. And this will be done under a separate treaty and a separate article, 218 of the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. We're not quite clear as to what this relationship is going to consist of, but looking at Mrs May's speeches on the UK White Paper, it's clear it is intended on their part to cover trade, politics, security, defence, policy cooperation, motherhood, and apple pie stuff like cooperation on research and development or whatever. This will require ratification by all national parliaments and in some cases by regional parliaments, such as the Parliament of Wallonia. Hence, the negotiations for here will have to be concluded a year be before the end of the deadline, in other words, by March 2021, and then ratified within a year. Because there's a timetable which has been laid down by the European Parliament, it has said you've got three years and that's it to do the second uh, agreement. The key thing about um, <clears throat> interim arrangements, which I'm going to talk about next, is that when you look at uh, Article 50, it has a very stark sentence in it that um, the withdrawing state, its membership finishes at the end of two years, just like that, with or without an agreement. So. Obviously, if it, uh, if, if it leaves an, at midnight on the 29th of, Mar 29th of March 2019, something has got to be in place a minute past midnight. And that's where we come to these uh, with, with interim arrangements. Otherwise, there will be a legal vacuum uh, which will have quite catastrophic effects. Michael O'Leary, for example, has said no planes will fly. 
Uh, so we're going to have to fit in these interim arrangements inside a space of three years, and as I've said, they've been limited to that by the European Parliament. Slide-wise, we're now, I beg your pardon, we're now, I'm, I'm rushing so much to get into my 15 minutes that I, <clears throat> we're on slide nine. What's the, title of that? the Brexit bill. That well-known pop star. <clears throat> the, on the Brexit bill, this is the uh, first big obstacle to be overcome. This has got to be done by November, get over this obstacle. The figure is being computed at around 100 billion gross. Michael Tutte, uh, that most distinguished former official in finance, has written a paper which the Institute of International European Affairs on this matter has put up on its own website. Now that's a gross figure. Um, it has of course been contested by the United Kingdom to say the least of it. So what we're talking about here is not the exact figure but to agree first of all on the principle that they do owe this money. Boris Johnson said last week we don't go whistle. Uh, and secondly, if they do owe the amount, how it's to be computed, in other words, the methodology. So, very cleverly, the European <coughs> Union side has sequenced the negotiations in such a way that you've got to deal with this first before you get on to the new relationship. So, it's like the sword of Damocles swinging over the council between now and November. The second obstacle to be jumped to is uh, the role of the Court of Justice. Um, the British opposition to the role of the, court, the European Court of Justice is visceral, utterly irrational, and you really can't uh, uh, come and, and try to understand this from, on, the, on any, any intellectual basis. Um, go have a look at the words of Ian Duncan Smith, uh, just to get a flavour of this. Now, the ECJ, as we know, is central to the operation of the Customs Union set up by the Treaty of Rome after all to do so. And also the EFTA court, which looks after the European economic area and access to the single market, is a complement to the Court of Justice. Now, if the United Kingdom doesn't accept the role of the ECJ or the EFTA court, there are no solutions to either the common market or single market membership. There's no known solution as of now. With regards to the framework, just to come back to that, it is mentioned in the Article 50 in that the withdrawal agreement has got to be done taking account, as it says, of the framework. So that really is going to depend on the choices that Britain wants to make over its membership of the customs union and the single market. This will be a critical phase in the negotiations, in other words, starting around Christmas, when these choices will become evident, if they are to become evident. And the framework ultimately will be, of course, incorporated in the withdrawal agreement. Now, sorry, just to re recap, Mrs. May has laid down a number of red lines. Nobody has else has laid down red lines. The union position is clear. It's governed by the treaties. But she has introduced unilaterally red lines, four of them. Just to recap, Introduce border controls in order to uh, control immigration of EU nationals, EU nationals, not non-EU nationals, EU nationals. The role of the ECJ, the ending its jurisdiction in Britain, ceasing payments into the budget, and securing freedom to conduct trade deals on a global basis. In other words, global Britain, responsibility being given to Liam Fox. As a consequence, of those uh, red lines, we can now say with certainty, I think, it's my view, that Britain will be out of the customs union, out of the single market, and won't join the European economic area. What slide are we oh my God, number 14. <laughs> <coughs> the uncertainties. I'm not doing this job very good up here. It's, it's all Rory Quinn's fault, uh, I'm telling you. So when we come on to the cert uncertainties, now we're into the realm of politics. What's uncertain, of course, is uh, the future of Mrs. May, the future of her red lines as a consequence, a hard or a soft Brexit, and Ireland, the issues relating to Ireland, the common travel area, the border, and trade with the United Kingdom. Next slide. So. The choice in regards to a hard or soft border, this is a big uncertainty, 
really, as I've said earlier, resides around the future role of the ECJ in Britain, about the free movement of labour, about the uh, common commercial policy, which is an integral part of the Treaty of Rome. So my definition of a soft uh, Brexit is that Britain, through some miracle or another, remains in both the common, in the common uh, customs union and the single market. A hard one is that they are out of both. So, next slide. Now, what's uncertain, the other big uncertainty is about what Mrs May herself has called the cliff edge. If there's no interim regime, in other words, to be negotiated from Christmas onwards, then, as she has described it, there will be a cliff edge and it will be inevitable. Common sense, therefore, dictates that there should be an interim regime. But the interim regime, in order to come into existence and to be negotiated, the logic of it is the interim regime will have to be based on the continuation of the status quo. That is to say that the United Kingdom does not leave for three years after it withdraws from the European Union. But there's no guarantee whatsoever that common sense is going to apply. Hence, we've got to take cliff edge into account as a real possibility. Over the weekend, people have up to the, the, the odds on uh, the ante on, on a cliff edge happening. The next slide says uh, red lights flashing. Because they're flashing in London because this has now been identified as a real issue. This is where the logic of the decision to withdraw is now coming home in concrete terms and lots of people in the United Kingdom do not wish to accept the consequences of what it was they decided in the referendum. Five minutes. Five minutes. So we have a look at the uh, possibility, of course, of a change of government which might change the, the red lines or whatever. Now, I'll move on to the unknowns. The list here, again, is political and just put them up for discussion. There's the future itself of the uh, United Kingdom political system. Uh, is there a real fundamental realignment taking place? If so, how does that affect the red, light, the red line issues? Whether or not populism throughout the rest of the EU would have an impact on EU solidarity, which up to this point has, has been indivisible. The willingness of the United Kingdom, of the European Union to accommodate these impossible conditions or demands of the UK is unknown. The nature of the new EU-UK relationship clearly then is unknown, and so too, therefore, the future of Irish relations with the UK. Last week in the Financial Times, there was one article which um, said, here's what might happen in this slide 21, three possible outcomes, and they're his, uh, the author, not mine. One was that uh, reality might break out in the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom accepts all of the EU conditions, and red lines, its red lines, uh, and, and drops its own red lines. In other words, capitulation. The other is intransigence. We're not giving in on anything, go whistle, in which case then we have a cliff edge and we're all in deep trouble. Or a reversal of the Mrs. May's uh, Article 50 letter to Donald Tusk and it's withdrawn. I think that is completely unlikely. In fact, I can't see any of these three working out. With regards to the economic, which is the next slide, that is a, just a sum, that's a big un uncertainty. We don't know what the effect of all this is going to be on the UK. Uh, over the last two weeks, I've been dragging together all of the forecasts of various organizations and institutes, uh, about 20 in all. They all agree on only one thing, we don't know because of the uncertainty about the future. So hence, we don't know the knock-on effect on the Irish economy. We don't know the effect of sterling depreciation, which is going to be continuous in my view on Irish competitiveness. We don't know the scale of loss of the U our, our UK market share, uh, and we don't know how successful we will be or not in securing new markets by way of, of, of uh, replacement. So part four summarizes all of that, and uh, next slide, which is also 24, goes through the impossibilities we've done that. Um, I'll just add a postscript, which is the next slide. Are we looking at, uh, as I said earlier, a rearrangement uh, of uh, realignment of politics, what, what political scientists call new cleavages? It's obvious that something happened in the last election, just, just been held. It's obvious now that age and education has come out as a major division inside British society. 
replacing the old, not replacing, but complementing the old division, divisions of class and region. We don't know whether there's a par paradigm shift a la Macron on their way in the United Kingdom as well. I think not. And we don't know the future of the United Kingdom, uh, in other words, Scotland. Last slide, really, of any note is a health warning. There's no easy way out of this for us. There is no easy solution. We did not create the problem. We've got to deal with it, but there's no easy solution. A hard border <clears throat> is the most likely outcome for the reasons I've given earlier. We will suffer an asymmetric economic shock, and we need to develop a narrative that explains this to an otherwise, so far, really uninformed electorate. And to do all that, we need to fix a broken political system. Easier said than done. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.